we turn our attention to what might be called the libertarian left, or more popularly, anarchism. This is the same logic shared by Marx and Freud. Functioning libertarian socialist institutions, I think they are an interesting model that uh, I think is highly relevant. Not like the automated voice no hi <laughs> hello <laughs> yeah so the spotify wraps just came up for us remember that we are recording in the near past and i'm currently upset because i bought physical vinyls for like lana del rey and i'm still in the top 10 percent worldwide listeners i'm in the top two percent for mitski i have her last records on vinyl i listen to them constantly on my record player and spotify is being cruel to me <laughs> it's really bad <laughs> hannah my top four songs were all from preacher's daughter which i think says a lot about me <laughs> <laughs> yeah have you heard of preacher's daughter igor i have not you need to listen to it it's sick <laughs> yeah it's like southern baptist type of feel it's so good and it's from um a trans woman in the american south but sh she writes this like concept album so it's not her own life it's like a story of a preacher's daughter but she's doing like a three-part thing where it's the preacher's daughter the preacher's mother and then the preacher's wife and so she's doing all these three parts the story's so good and all the songs are like super long like my top song is thoroughfare which i think is like an eight nine maybe ten 10 minute song it's so good though <laughs> i just find it really funny that you're like i know nothing about religion and then you're listening <laughs> to someone's three-part series on religious trauma <laughs> oh also ego you're super cute for like your your third podcast was out podcast <laughs> yep that's because i only probably listened to like five podcasts and they're all there, say that. So. <laughs> no we're the top Okay. You're the top three. You're top mm. three. That's because you have very long episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Which, ironically, we are shortening. Yeah. <laughs> Good circle into what we're discussing today. We read all of the Seducer's Diary by Soren Kierkegaard. Yes, we did. It was it was quite long. I did not expect it to be that long. It flew by. I was very shocked. I read it all just yesterday, quite easily as well. Um, today we're joined by kind of a uh, resident expert in Kierkegaard, but also a friend of mine who, how long have we known each other? It's been years now, hasn't it? It's been a few. I think we've known each other since 2016, maybe. Wow. But yeah, we've known each other for a while. We used to work at a student union together. I think that's how we met. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Igor, if you want to introduce yourself. Yes, uh, I'm Igor Ahmedov. I'm a junior research fellow in philosophical theology at the University of Tartu in Estonia. And I am researching Soren Kierkegaard. And uh, not exactly the text we have read, although I do quote him uh, a few times because it's just such an important text, I think. But I'm looking primarily at his views on education and his theology and philosophy of education. But with Kierkegaard, you just have to kind of know all of it to understand the overall project that he's doing. Yeah, it's good. It's really, um, it was interesting. So if you can introduce us to Kierkegaard as a person, that would be really helpful because me and Paolo purposely just didn't know a lot because we went into the reading really blind. And then when I started to know, I realized exactly what you said. You kind of need to know like everything to get some of it. And I think it would be worth it. So yeah. Yeah, it's hard to introduce it when you're like in the UK or maybe American context. In Estonia, when I introduce him to, to students, I say, oh, imagine Tartu, which is a university city. You know, there have all the intellectuals, people living there. It's about 100,000 people. Uh, so that's Copenhagen in the uh, 19th century where Kierkegaard is, is living in at the beginning and middle of, of 19th century. And he is a university student. Um, does his stuff, gets his theology degree and becomes the kind of, you know, a literary figure in, in Danish society and writes in pseudonyms, uh, writes under his own names, uh, says that, you know, the pseudonyms are not me, denies it all, then accepts all of it. But at the core of him, I guess, is the fact that he's a, a Christian. So um, he wants to develop this kind of an understanding of how to live your life 
I guess. And he's very unhappy with the way people around him in the kind of, you know, the capital of, of Denmark at the time live, when we are still, you know, in the kind of Enlightenment era, where Christianity is becoming more rationalized, you know, the myths are being taken away. And Kierkegaard is kind of wants to put a, a stop on that. But I think for today's text, maybe an important part of his biography is that he was engaged. He was engaged to Regine Olsen, a girl with whom he was for one year, and then he broke off his engagement. And this work comes as a result of that breaking off of the engagement. And maybe, you know, as we go through the podcast, we can discuss how that, you know, affects the, the text. But he's really inspired by by that breaking off of the engagement and by the reasons he has for doing that. Uh, so so that's Kierkegaard. I guess um, those texts that he writes are one of the most important in, in Danish literature. Um, and he, he works at the same time as Hans Christian Andersen, so the famous fairy tale writer. He actually critiques him at some point so so that's that's where he comes from amazing so <laughs> what me and paolo wanted to do before Igor actually tells us what we actually read we want to explain it from our point of view <laughs> so we read the seducer's diary which is part of a book i believe called either or and i don't know the date of it off the top of my mind Igor, what was the date uh, I believe it's 1843. So we read this uh, Seducer's Diary. It's quite a long piece, 100%. I will say, we do tell you not to read lots of things on here because they're like super intense or like long-winded or lots of things. Unedited. Reasons. Yeah, unedited. <laughs> <laughs> but this one, I would tell you hands down to read. Even if you don't like understand it on a philosophical level, it's just like really fun. So I don't know anybody's name because I forget names off the top of my head. So maybe Paolo remembers them. Apart from Cordelia, I remember her name. The Seducer's Diary essentially starts with a character or a person finding a diary in a desk. And he seems like super upset about it, basically. And he says the diary is from somebody he knows who it turns out he's living this other life as a seducer um, and a seducer of women. You know, the, the picture you get at the start of it is that he's a practice seducer. Like he he knows what he's doing. And he makes this line being like, oh, I don't know if he seduced anybody else, but I kind of like guess he probably has. And he's talking about in this diary, he's talking about seducing, I think her name is Cordelia. Hopefully I'm getting it right. Yeah, okay. I also have the line, it's whether he has seduced others, I do not know, but that seems to be borne out by his papers. And it's on page 306. So he's seducing this woman called Cordelia and the person who found the diary knows Cordelia as well and also gets some of Cordelia's letters. She writes three letters to him when he leaves her, not the person who found the letters, the other person. I think his name's Johannes. Johannes. So Johannes is the seducer. And so Cordelia has written three letters to Johannes after Johannes left her and he returns them unopened, which is just so savage. And in one of the letters uh, on page 15 to 16 and we were reading which version again? Hong's edition by the Hong, existing yeah. University Press. So we were reading that edition. So on page 15 to 16 in one of her letters she goes, I call you mine and call myself yours and as it once flattered your ear, proudly inclined to my adoration, so shall it now sound as a curse upon you. A curse for all eternity. Yours, I am yours, yours, your curse. She's angry. <laughs> It, once more, I messaged her and I was like, this reminds me of Fleetwood Mac's like uh, Silver Springs. Like, you'll never get away from the sound of the woman that loves you, which is a total curse from Stevie Nicks. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I was really shocked at how things really have not changed. Literally. <laughs> oh my God, we'll talk about it. Because like, some of it, I've written notes that are like, oh, this does not surprise me. I've either had <laughs> this happen to me or, you know, I know of experiences where <laughs> this has happened. <laughs> well, sending <laughs> back a letter unread is just basically blocking someone on whatsapp <laughs> like just blocking their number <laughs> literally savage so imagine that like you're obsessed with this person they block you so she's mad so then it goes into and i was quite surprised by this because obviously I, we were going in blind it goes into just full diary entries from different times i don't know if it's like supposed to be the full diary entries or just like specific ones but it's all diary entries from johannes and Johannes is, and we we are gonna say this, and then I'm gonna bleep it out in editing. But he is a f boy, like he's awful. 
<laughs> I described him as a man that you meet that is medium attractive, like kind of ugly, but unemployed mattress on the floor where you're just like this man is horrible for me but I'm gonna a hundred percent give in and then you're like I'm not gonna give my heart to this person and when the relationship's over it's life altering you have to go into therapy over this man that does not even own a car literally <laughs> and also I kept saying it to Paolo this is the kind of man that I would be obsessed with <laughs> he's giving unemployed he is giving unemployed I, I'm in a healthy relationship now but I'd be obsessed with this man a hundred percent I already rinsed and recycled these men I avoid them like the plague. They show up and I'm like, please do not come to the store. <laughs> I invite them in, unfortunately. Oh, also, I will say partway through the diaries, he does include letters that were sent to Cordelia. And so these letters, I was screaming. Anyway, so it starts with him meeting Cordelia. He's a bit creepy about it. Like he's giving stalker. It's giving you as in like the TV show you. But then I was like, you know, in this time period, is there any other way to meet somebody that you want to see again without like running into them accidentally quote unquote so <laughs> he is like following this woman around at some point he can't find her and he gets really like obsessed and he writes about that for a long time and then he sees her again he's like going into like friends houses that are near the path that he knows she goes by just so he can watch her from the window it is really strange but <laughs> he he is like I can make this woman fall in love with me but it's not going to be like super simple and also I will say like part way through some of his discussions of like his relationship with Cordelia he does also drop different discussions of him running into other couples or other women and that confused me a little bit and then I realized what was happening so if you're thrown off that's kind of what is happening but fast forward a bit so he needs to find a way to go into her house so she is being raised by her aunt her aunt's kind of a loner from what I gathered and so he can't find a way to get into the house but he realizes there is this guy called Ed Edward, who, uh, poor sweet Edward, who is head over heels in love with Cordelia and also is like a family friend. So he befriends Edward and he starts to like feed him ways to get with Cordelia. And he's like, I'm not even bothered about this. So he goes into the house and he does this thing. He does this thing where he'll go with Edward. Edward will be talking with Cordelia and he'll be talking with the aunt. And I couldn't get it. Is he talking to the aunt about agriculture? I cannot remember the yeah. exact detail, but what he's <laughs> doing is he realizes that the aunt basically controls Cordelia's life and everything the aunt says Cordelia tends to do. So while Edward's being a little sap over Cordelia, he's basically going... I'm kind of the greatest person ever created. Like, God bless me upon this earth. And you need to love me so that perhaps when Edward goes away, I can snack it up. I think what's being completely missed is that he is 100% controlling the entire situation. He is master puppeteering all of these people's lives. He goes after Cordelia because she is young. And impressionable and he knows that i think there's parts of the text and correct me if i'm wrong igor where he's purposely saying i want a young woman because a woman will know exactly where i'm going with this but a younger woman is easy to manipulate because they're still like they have this like virginal light to them and like he doesn't say naivety but he's playing on that naivety and when he is at the aunt's house he's just sort of like he's like doing research he's trying to see how people react what edward's saying how deep Edward's falling for Cordelia I think at some point he's like trying to get him more and more in love with her so when she breaks it off with him he just like falls from grace and he is banking on that and he's taking absolute pleasure in that so yeah Johannes is uh, we've all met uh, Johannes let's be honest here yeah yeah so eventually he does get what he wants this was sh a shock to me because I didn't think he would go this far the way he gets Edward away from um, Cordelia is he literally just proposes to Cordelia and he's like well I think in her surprise she'll say yes but she doesn't say yes she says go to my aunt ask my aunt and the aunt's like yeah obviously love this man he's great he talks to me about agriculture he's 10 out of 10 <laughs> He's so okay. smart. <laughs> and so then he talks about, because Cordelia is like unsure about the engagement or like why this man has proposed to her, he's slowly sending her these letters and they are so intense. <laughs> 
bits. I've got bits from his letters. Most of my notes were like bits from these letters. On page 132, he writes, Are you dizzy, my Cordelia? Then hold fast to me. I do not become dizzy. Intellectually, one never becomes dizzy if one thinks of only one thing, and I think only of you. Physically, one never becomes dizzy if one looks fixedly at only one object, and I look only at you. Hold tight, if the world passed away, if our light carriage disappeared beneath us, we would still cling to each other, floating away in the harmony of the spheres. So, you know, she's just falling from him, obviously, because he's writing all these, like, beautiful letters. He's playing, like, partially hard to get, but also deeply in love with her, but also, like, a bit mean about it at times. He's doing, like, the seduction artist, whatever it's called. You know what I'm talking about? I it was, like, really agree. popular in the early 2000s. It's, like, really, like, loser men would pay for this flirting coach to help them flirt with women. They would teach them how to egg women and be, like, you would be really beautiful if you were, like, less fat. And then they ruin a woman's, like, confidence so low that then they swoop in and, like, grab them. Yeah, so he's basically trying to do that. But in like a more fancy way, I guess. Is it fancy or is it the 1800s? Maybe. (laughs) (laughs) So she becomes obsessed with him and then he like starts to play it cold. Well, she's starting to like really care about him. Then he starts playing it cold and getting her to break off the engagement, which is so crazy to me. He doesn't break it off himself because he's like... That would put me in a bad light and I don't want that. So he's getting her to break off the engagement. She eventually breaks off the engagement and is then just like devastated by it. And he's like, I'm done. Great. 10 out of 10. <laughs> like, Time to go done. do it again. I think they sleep together at the end. Is that yeah. implied? Okay. So she comes and finds him. So she goes away to her family somewhere in the country and she's like really upset about him. And he's still sending these letters, being like, I don't know why you broke off the engagement. And then she comes to his house and they spend one night together. And then he's like, ah, Bye. Jesus. <laughs> I think also his use of language, because if I read it correctly, once more, I read it all in one sitting, which next time would like sit with it because I will read this again. He also purposely uses language and his knowledge of language. So he knows that she can't understand a lot of Latin. So in certain parts, he's playing around with Latin, like kind of egging her on with that meanness. But also she does understand German. At some points, he describes her as langweilig, which is like boring. And it's such a purposeful use of langweilig. And I was just like, it's such a mean thing to do. <laughs> yeah, so that's what we read. Uh, now Igor can actually tell us what any of it means and kind of the context of it. I think... It's perfect. <laughs> I, I think you got what Kierkegaard wanted you to get out of this reading. And I think this is what readers who first read him also got out of it. As I already mentioned, there's this Regine Olsen figure in the back. And I don't want to project Kierkegaard to Johannes and Regine to Cordelia, but sometimes it is done. Although I, I disagree with that projection. We might discuss that maybe at some point later why. But this is all of this things um, happening in the background. And um, Paula, you describe Johannes as the one kind of unemployed. I would disagree. I think he is a university graduate, at least. You know, in today's world, like humanities university graduate, he's very well educated. He's probably got a good job, actually. And uh, he can afford that kind of life of leisure. So it's a it's a very intellectual thing that, that he's doing. So it's, it's not just a, a nobody. But as it was mentioned, the Seduces Diary is just a part of a larger work. So it comes at the very end of Either or Part 1. And Kierkegaard also wrote Either or Part 2. So there's two volumes in the book. And Either or Part 1 is itself about 450 pages long. So it's a part of a, of a massive, long text where Kierkegaard wants to achieve something. And what he wants to achieve, first of all, is for us to be disgusted, like clearly. We uh, need to have some kind of emotion when we finished reading The Seducer's Diary. And this is precisely what what you got. You you got it perfectly, you know, all of those emotions, especially, again, reading it in 21st century, you know, in our context of feminist movement and etc. Again, it's a completely different experience, although I've read commentaries from uh, Kierkegaard contemporaries and female contemporaries, and they were also just as, you know, disgusted as, as as anyone was. So so in that sense, not much has changed. But part one of either or is focusing on what it is to live an aesthetic life. And what Kierkegaard tries to describe with Johannes is the life of an aesthete. He's the kind of the ultimate 
aesthete. And what makes him the ultimate one and not just a, a general one or a, a bad one is because uh, Johannes uh, has this opportunity to reflect. He knows what he's doing. He thinks about it. Because earlier on in Either Or Part 1, Kierkegaard goes into Mozart's opera Don Giovanni and he describes there the whole figure of, of Don Giovanni and how Don Giovanni, for example, he doesn't uh, reflect. He seduces girls on, on his way, you know, sings his opera. Leporello describes, you know, a thousand and one, a thousand and two, a thousand and three, you know, all the girls that he seduced everywhere. Uh, but Don Giovanni just moves on. With Johannes, it's it's not as easy. He does move on, but this, there is this whole elaboration of why he has to he has to move on. And uh, maybe another thing to mention about the diary itself, it is also mentioned uh, within the diary, the pseudonym that is writing it or whoever found it. He says that I've inserted the letters as I thought, you know, seem fit. So there is this whole construction. And, and this is why, in, for example, in literature studies, people also study Kierkegaard and not just in philosophy, because he constructs this whole monster of a book and, and it's it's been called by contemporaries a monster of a book precisely because there's so many layers of what is happening. So first of all, it is not Kierkegaard who writes it, but the pseudonym and the pseudonym got all those characters and one of the characters finds the, the diary and there's more characters within that diary. So to say that Kierkegaard thinks that Kierkegaard doesn't want to do that. And in the second part of Either Or, he presents us with a, with a new figure, Judge William, who is a, a judge in, in Denmark. He's married, loves his wife, and Kierkegaard looks at how the married life works out in conversation with a character called A, which is supposed to be the character from the first part of Either Or. So whether it is Johannes or, or someone similar, but it is aesthete. So he creates up this kind of dialectic between aesthetic life and the ethical life that Judge William in the second part of Either Raw uh, signifies, but overall, those are still not the the ultimate life that we are supposed to live. That was really eloquently put. I kind of want to go deeper into aesthetic and um, Johannes's own consciousness of it, because throughout the text, he does reflect, but he only reflects on what he's doing. And it sort of makes me think of, this is so, so very not academic, but it makes me think of that like dazed and confused quote. That is, uh, that's what I love about high school girls, man. I get older and they stay the same age. So there's also this, it's sort of aesthetic culture around males and male presentation where I think like the text sort of starts going into it and probably goes deeper into it. But male culture specifically during this time period is is, I don't know how much like the Victorian was in, Den <laughs> in Denmark, but there is that like sort of you are aiming to get married, but you kind of want to play the field a little bit. And I think where I'm still sort of putting it together, since I don't know Kierkegaard very well, just met him, it's how does he talk about this sort of altering culture and a culture of the, the rich having time to play around with these young girls and leading up to marriage or even leading to a traditional life. Like, is there a balance or is there just the aesthetic versus the, the course? So I would say that maybe they're a bit more conservative, or at least Kierkegaard is a bit more conservative in, in what he thinks or, or perceives as right. So one of the reasons why he writes this book and why he writes Seduce's Diary is precisely to save his own ex fiance regime. So in, in that society, and I guess it was the same in, in, in England, Victorian times, was that if a man breaks off the engagement, then, you know, it's the girl's fault. Something, something's wrong with her. So I guess there is interesting dynamic in Seduce's diary that it is her who breaks it off, not him. Uh, so, so you know, maybe it does want to say something about Johannes in that sense, you know, that why would girl break it off? But in terms of Kierkegaard and, and Denmark at the time, because he breaks engagement with Regine, he has to write this diary to kind of explain or at least uh, excuse Regine and say, I am the bad guy, because uh, he knows that she did nothing wrong. So he writes this book and then the people who read, they know immediately that it is Kierkegaard, although it's a pseudonym, they know who it is. Uh, and they say, like, oh, he, he is this bad guy. So now, now we know it's not Regine's fault. So there's still those kind of things happening. And I guess 
the life of the society is like that, you know, that people do do play around uh, and then still settle down, get married, but have mistresses. But I don't think that's the kind of class that Kierkegaard is describing here to be precisely, you know, one-to-one connection. I think it's more of a kind of middle-class uh, existence. And I'm not expert in, in Victorian England to to know, you know, whether they had the same kind of dynamics happening as at least I see in, in, in Bridgerton or whatever, you know, <laughs> TV series, uh, to know how the rich behave yeah i guess like we've kind of we've kind of painted this picture of like the aesthetic and the ethical life but i think there's still some questions that i have about what is aesthetic is aesthetic like hedonism i read after i had read the seducer's diary about you know he's he's showing two sides where you are going too far into either side and so the issue is not that johannes is like i guess seducing her it's how he's doing that seduction i think you kind of have both touched on it it's i was just reading my notes and there's a quote like very late on in page 177 and it says this one girl the one and only in all the world she must belong to me she must be mine let god keep his heaven if i may keep her he wants to fully own her whole experience but also he doesn't want to keep her he wants her to you know he talks a lot throughout about her keeping her freedom and the freedom is like very important to him because if she's not free then there's no point to this there's no game and it's the manipulation of people's like a you know we we were speaking about it earlier it's the manipulation of people like like almost if they're like chess pieces so i don't know but i i find it interesting you said about you know she's the one who breaks off the engagement and that's important i guess because it also keeps this sense of freedom i think you're at the heart of what is happening with the whole project of Kierkegaard. So as I said, he's got those three things, the aesthetic, the ethical, and then later on will come the religious sphere of existence. So for him, all human beings exist in one of those three spheres. And the most basic one is the aesthetic sphere. So when we're talking about the aesthetic, we're not talking about the kind of I don't know, critique of, of beauty or of art of things, although he does do that as well uh, at some points but he thinks about the the way we live uh, our life and in that sense we're inspired by the german romanticism you know and german idealism so all of those intellectual currents uh, happening in europe at the time and the project of going through the spheres is precisely that uh, of the attainment of freedom and eventually for kierkegaard he would say that the only freedom the ultimate freedom that is possible it is in the religious sphere it's you know your freedom with and, and before god but we haven't you know, gone there at all uh, with our reading, but that's that's the goal. And in each of those spheres, whether it's aesthetic or ethical, there is this illusion of freedom. But in the aesthetic sphere on its own, what moves a person, it's uh, the person's own uh, self-interest. So we can kind of establish the kind of freedom of me doing whatever the hell I want. So this is, you know, me, I find something interesting. And th- this concept, interesting, is very important for him because that's what motivates you to do something. He finds Cordelia interesting. The seduction process is interesting. If there was no difficulty in getting Cordelia, he would never have gone and tried to seduce her because that's that's just too easy. So so that's the kind of currents that are happening, at least in uh, in his head or Kierkegaard's head and also in, in Johannes's head when he is uh, being that aesthete. But it's also what I mentioned with, you know, with Don Giovanni. In that sense, Don Giovanni is the very basic idea of the aesthete because he doesn't even understand what is happening. With Johannes, there is this reflection and the end of the aesthetic sphere and the possibility to go any further is that you have to despair. So as I said, you know, for Kierkegaard, it's also important what happens to the reader of the book, not the characters, the reader. So when you read this book, when it does something to you, you want to not be like that. You want to have something better. So that kind of pushes you, whether it's to despair or, or to somewhere else and to think, oh, I don't want to live like that. So so that that is what's happening. Yeah, because like reading it now, like I think reflecting also on what you just said, Johannes's approach to all of this almost seems like a scientific method. He has the question, then he has the hypothesis. He does the experiment. He comes to the conclusion where he wins. And it's sort of going into like the last bits of the remaining enlightenment. I think there is that like point where the aesthetic is also in- involucrated with science and it's involucrated with like methodological approaches. Whereas with the ethical, it shouldn't be that approach. It should just be innate. 
or at least what I like went through all of this and now hearing he said feels like he kind of wants us to go back to our instinct rather than this mythological approach of towards each other. If I'm reading it correctly or if I'm misunderstanding, please stop me. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say that, number one, when you were saying about the, you know, I was being a bit silly earlier, but like I was genuinely invested in these characters. When Cordelia writes those letters, it genuinely moved me because I feel like I felt like that person, you know what I mean? And so, like, I wonder if Johannes then, without maybe knowing it, or maybe he does know it, he gives her that freedom, that despair to like move her forward. Or maybe, maybe he's not thinking of it. But I wonder, because he's clearly putting a lot of thought into it, does he think about the effects after? Or is that not the point and not the purpose? Well, with Kierkegaard, the correct reading is whatever you've read and decided. So that's one of the beauties, and that's why I'm working with him. So in terms of Paolo's idea about whether he wants us to come back to our instincts, I'm not sure. To be honest, I think what I for forgot to mention, but I think it's really important actually, is that in Danish there are two words for love. One is elskov, and the other is shalihet. And elskov is this kind of erotic love. And throughout this work, whenever he talks about love, is always in terms of elskov, the the erotic, and never shalihet, which is the kind of you know neighborly love or friendly love or the kind of agape idea in in Christian theology of love. So. That kind of puts a perspective on even the love that is happening in the aesthetic sphere is also not genuine. It's a part of a bigger picture, but it's not genuine. Another thing to mention there is that even when person is in, for example, ethical or in religious sphere, he can still behave in some sense like the person in the aesthetic sphere. So he can still love he can still be the kind of, you know, playboy personality. He can still do all those things. But there's something that's fundamentally, you know, changes because it is not the the goal anymore, not the end of in itself, you know, not my immediate pleasure. That's where the shift focuses. And in terms of whether Johannes gives her freedom, I think in a sense that's what he wants to do. Because I think at some point he says that she needs to learn how to love because only then she will uh, know how to love him properly. And I think that kind of love is only possible in freedom. And whenever I talk about uh, The Seduces Diary, I, I always say it's a Bildungsroman. You know, it, it does try to kind of describe a process of education. And in that sense, Johannes acts as her as her teacher who teaches her to love. And, you know, a student has to graduate one day and start making decisions for herself. So if in the beginning of the diary, Cordelia is seduced, and making decisions by the way Johannes constructs them, what's important with breaking of the engagement and then, you know, uh, sleeping with Johannes in the end, it's her own decisions now. Although they are a result of the seduction, but, you know, she does it not because he's still seducing her. She does it, well, I don't want to use the phrase, but out of her own free will, if I may put it this way. So the question I was going to ask then is, you know, we have the aesthetic sphere, but then what is kind of the ethical sphere? Because that also, you know, you know, like you were saying, if we're aiming to get the to the religion sphere, it's still not correct. So I, I'd be interested to in know kind of what that next step is then. Yeah, whenever I describe it to students or to anyone who asks, I always give it as an example of, of marriage, which is what Kierkegaard also uses. And I'm not sure whether that's faithful to him or whether that's my interpretation of him. But basically, if in aesthetic sphere, you love because that's your, you know, first instinct. You, you see a girl or a man or whoever, and you're like, yeah, I want them. Uh, and then all of this chemistry starts working. In the ethical sphere, and the example of Judge William and his wife is, okay, you're married and you love in marriage. But what happens at the end of the part two of either or is that how happy is Judge William about his marriage? And the answer is, well, not really. Some of the discussion that he's uh, having there, it's like, you know, yes, I have the wife. Uh, she's beautiful. She's great. She does everything I need of her. But there's still something, something missing. And Kierkegaard, or I think Kierkegaard would say is that because in marriage, what happens then it's you love because you're obliged to love. So, you know, it's, it is your duty to love. So there is nothing special anymore. It's not the kind of selfish love of the aesthete that loves only because he wants to get something, but it's now just loving for the sake of loving. And that is also not the kind of correct place where to be. 
So I do kind of want to know about the religious fit, but I kind of want to sit with like this right now, this idea of like, he's living because he's obliged to love rather than he's living because he actually loves or he's loving proactively, I guess. It's not a proactive love. And if I can attach to that, it feels like with both aesthetic and ethical forms of love, there's a consequence. It's never fully it's never fully happy or there is like a fleetingness to it so with aesthetic it is quick it is instinctual it is our body's chemistry just reacting to someone and the ethical is it's sort of once it's been there for a while it dies down to something else and it leaves you wanting more so is there a balance is there a way to approach these two things together the other question I was going to ask, which we can jump to this after, I guess, but I kind of want to get it out, is why did Kierkegaard break up the engagement? Because he's clearly, like you were saying, he's using this to justify breaking up the engagement. And he's using this in a way that is caring because he's doing it to make sure that she's not blamed for it. So why? <laughs> in terms of the the first part, um, for sure, there is this fleetingness, you know, there is this never being fully realized idea or even if it is realized with the aesthetic you always need to get your you know fix of of love you always need to get those you know serotonin or whatever you know going in in you with the uh, ethical yeah you get it and then it's kind of you know it's just there and then dies down it's precisely that and Kierkegaard says you know what happens what is the end is uh, another book that he has it's the sickness unto death it is despair basically. So this is what happens. And and despair is actually a good thing because despair makes you think, you know, something is wrong with my life. So I get those quick fixes. I'm not satisfied. I despair. And maybe that despair helps to push me to a higher stage of existence, which is ethical. I despair in my marriage life and maybe it can also push me to the religious sphere. And just to kind of say a little bit more about the religious sphere, it's a paradoxical religious. And the paradox is precisely this, that the commandment to love is almost impossible to achieve because Kierkegaard just sets it as such a mass, uh, high pedestal, which he gets from the Bible, where it says, you know, you should love your neighbor as yourself, but also Kierkegaard adds, you should love your enemy. And, you know, with the enemy love, it's, well, how am I supposed to do that? So the love is paradox, because, of course, it is impossible to love on that level. But Kierkegaard, a, a good Christian, he was would answer, you know, but with God, everything is possible. And another thing about those stages is that there is nothing natural about living in a higher sphere. We're always in danger of slipping back. So it's not that I've achieved this enlightenment or nirvana or I don't know what in the religious. No, I'm always in danger of slipping back. I'm always in danger of despairing. And when I despair, there is my choice. I slip back to the previous sphere or it pushes me to stay somewhere. So I hope that kind of answers some of those things. In terms of why Kierkegaard breaks off his engagement, well, my answer is because he loves Regina so much and he loves her till his death. So when he dies, everything that he owns goes to Regina. So he, he leaves everything to her. At some point later on, he tried to mended he tried to get back together with her but regina was already engaged at that time to another person so they never they never got back why does he do that at that specific point there's a lot of speculation about kierkegaard and what was wrong with him so one of it is that he finds out that he had a sexually transmitted disease and he doesn't want to give it on so in that sense you know out of love and out of care for her he was like you know i don't i don't want to pass that on um, another is that uh, there is speculation that he had a I think it's called frontal lobe epilepsy. And he also, you know, doesn't want to give that uh, to her. So he's got a lot of daddy issues, a lot of mummy issues, and, and those problems comes from that. So I think the way he discovers about the STD is there is speculation that his dad had it. So he told Soren and Soren's like, okay, what, what do I do now? So so there's a lot of the kind of mix up. He does talk about his dad's secret, and that's usually is being interpreted into those things. But with the uh, biographers and with the people who study Kierkegaard, there is no definitive answer because there was, I think, one letter of a doctor of Kierkegaard or, or someone who said that he knew what was wrong with him, but he doesn't write what it is. So it's still left a, as a mystery. And another thing is, uh, which is much worse, is that he realizes that if he wants to be an author, he wouldn't be able to do that if he gets married. Because if he gets married, that's precisely what's going to happen. He's going to become the kind of unethical person like Judge William, who will you know, be happily married, but the marriage is going to kind of be his duty. He's going to have to do all the marriage stuff and he won't be able to write. So 
yes, Regina was his first love, but I think writing and what he found, you know, needed to be done in Denmark at the time was even more important. But as I say, until the very end, he still loves her. What a weird little man. Because I think it's interesting that now knowing that he also left everything to her, and I don't know how the comparison now would be between Seducer's Diary and him, because Johannes would not leave anything for Cordelia. He doesn't seem like the type, he doesn't seem like the character. And it makes me also think, like, what would be his end? You know, would he be continually doing this cycle of aesthetics? Would the aesthetics change? Would it morph? Could this person become ethical? in some way or live a more ethical life which is something that like you know i think we've been skirting around a little tiny bit i don't know obviously evil knows more than us but i would say i think johannes is kind of beyond saving he's got it down to a science like you were saying it's like very methodological and i also think if he ever got married it'd be too boring like, it just wouldn't work for him. I don't know. I got the sense, and maybe maybe it's with all the letters, or I don't know. I got the sense that in the game, it's a very sad game. And he kind of knows that it's a sad game to be playing. And although it's fun at certain parts for him, it also seems to be, like, deeply traumatizing. You know, like, when he is seeing Edward with Cordelia, at that point, he says he is head over heels in love. And, you know, I wrote a note being like, you know, it reminds me of of people who say they're in love, like, almost like love at first sight. I'm in love with this person because I've seen this person. But you don't actually know that person on any real depth so what kind of love is that what kind of it do, it doesn't really work so that would be my answer but maybe Hugo has different f- thoughts so i have a fun fact is that uh, uh, regina had a sister and her name was Carmelia. so there is one letter difference between <laughs> cordelia and Carmelia, and uh, you know it makes you think it made me think what i first found out and uh, in one of his notebooks kierkegaard says that i think she's like the only smart person here or, or something like that i haven't checked the wording but that's the kind of vibe he was he was leaving so there's that but in in terms of whether johannes could be redeemed or 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 changed i think in terms of the project that kierkegaard is writing maybe maybe not because uh, in part Two of either or there is still this conversation going on between the the ethical person and the aesthete, and the aesthete is still not convinced. They're having this discussion, but but nothing is happening. But also, it, just in terms of the plot, I don't know if you did that, but what I did when I was reading it, I counted how many new girls appear in the story, and at, I think I counted at least six more. And what I imagine that if you know if Netflix would make part two of this, they would also make diaries for all the, those other girls because I think. Think exactly the same was happening for them at the same time. So, so, so in that sense, I think it's you know irredeemable. And in terms of this, the system that he is showing through uh, Johannes, he is also Kierkegaard. Is a bit funny with Hegel, and Hegel had this great system of how you know the world's spirit works and how the philosophy will come to the end and and the absolute spirit that is there and i think you know with with those systems maybe and kierkegaard is an ironist he's just making fun of all systems you know of people trying to do things systematically because in the end this is what it results in it results in at least moral failure if i can say so Paula, i was gonna ask you like a random question and igor i don't know if you read it yeah but we read for the podcast and i've read before bell hooks is all about love and i wondered because i i wrote a note about like i wonder how this relates or whether this relates or if there's a connection there because you know this is why i was talking about proactive and kind of passive love is bell hooks sees love as far as i remember as a very proactive thing it's something you work at and it's something that you want to do and there are people that deserve that love and there are people that do not deserve that love and yeah i wonder if Holly, you had any thoughts about it or ego if you've read it <laughs> <laughs> have you read it yeah i think yeah. you i think your comment would be much more enlightening because i didn't read bell hooks all about love till we did the recording and while we did it with Adebayo and sue and hannah who had already read it it was my first time reading it and i think it didn't hit me the same way as it did them because I'm reading it, you know, in my 30s, 
after we've already like gone through a lot of heartbreak where I felt like that reading was like, yeah, nothing's changed. And in that regard, the concept of love, I think as explored in this one, it's a bit different. Even the religious love is very different from Hux's narrative. Because I feel like in here, love is not something that you can really truly achieve because it's I think the end goal is heavenly love and heavenly love is all-knowing and it's beyond what a human is capable of providing and giving because the love from God is one that is of absolute forgiveness and with bell hooks for her love or at least if I remember correctly love can have a condition so it's been a while since I've read Bell Hooks and it, I've listened to your episode, but I always listen on like on 1.5. So <laughs> so it depends on <laughs> how much I remember from Bell Hooks. And fun fact, Hannah sent me the book. She was like, it's, it's such an amazing book. You have to read it. I'm going to send it to you. So she sent it to me to Estonia. Um, in terms of the idea that love is a work, Kierkegaard is on board with that. In terms of works of love, Kierkegaard got a book called exactly that. So love is a work. It's not it's not an emotion, it's it's not a feeling, it's something we have to work on to achieve. And as you said, Paul, you said that you know, beyond what human is capable of providing, well, as I said earlier, and Kiko would say yes, but with God everything is possible. He sets it up high, but at the same time, you know, he knows it is something that's unachievable, but we still have to work towards that. So even though if it's unachievable, we have we have to work towards loving your neighbor. Loving your enemy is, you know, it's a decision you have to make every day. And, you know, loving, whether it's also a, a romantic love, it is also something that has to be, you know, kind of repeated every day. And this is why the, the ethical kind of doesn't work, because, you know, you, you have to choose to love your wife every, every day uh, in that sense. I was just going to say, so another question I have for both of you is the relevance we see in Kierkegaard's work today. What it made me think about is that whom do we identify in the story with and whether there is this agenda difference as well. So when I read it, do I, as a, you know, as a man, identify with Cordelia or with Johannes? And when I read it, I think about how do I behave, for example, on Tinder or somewhere else in terms of Johannes. And then I think about my exes in terms of Cordelia. And not in the sense that I do those same things, but in terms of, you know, is my behavior somehow reflecting of that? Because, you know, that's why I identify it straight away. And sometimes I have to say, you know, maybe nothing bad happened in my life dramatically that, you know, I, sometimes, you know, Cordelia, yeah, you, you can you can see something like that. But personally for me, because as a man, I'm like, do, do I behave like that? Do I need to get my behavior in order? So, so I think that's what made me this whole discussion think about at the moment. It's been enough years I can talk about it, but I have been a Johannes. <laughs> you know, sometimes I was just like, oh, this is an attractive person. I'm just going to date them for a bit and then like throw them out. And I was like that in my 20s and no longer like that anymore. But like, I think it does fluctuate. There's points in your life where you're kind of a Johannes. And sometimes, you know, life bites you in the butt again and you become a Cordelia. I think these are just like the hyper identities of relationships in general even at the end of any relationship someone's bound to get hurt one person gets hurt more than the other and i think this is just like a very hyper dynamic of well one a lot of heterosexual relationships where the younger you are also the more painful the breakup is because i was also thinking about how young she is and she's going through all of this and once more had she been a little bit older maybe this wouldn't have been her first big breakup or her first time being fooled by this type of person but her being at a young age and this person being as you said also a lo more learned person there is also that like weird dynamic of experience and it kind of circles back to that like generational divide where he knows exactly what he's doing she is still learning what's going on and going back to another point this is like a teaching moment in a way but teaching at what cost yeah I will say like like you found <laughs> I feel like I've been both you know like it was really odd because when I read those letters from Cordelia I was like yeah I've been this person like I absolutely understand this like obsession she has with getting an answer from him 
And to the point where she's cursing him, she's like, I curse you. I love you and I won't ever let that go, but I curse you. Which is also, I guess, you know, going back to a question that we had earlier about would she move on? Is she truly free? Because those letters suggest not, but, you you know, having been that person, you do move on eventually. But also, as I carried on reading it, I was like, you know, let me not identify with Cordelia too much because I have I have been that person, that Johannes, right? That, like, playing with people's lives in that way. I also wonder, I guess, you know, you were talking about dating apps, Igor. Like, I wonder how much dating apps have fed into the way we live a more aesthetic life, right? Because the whole point is that you you're supposed to like look at somebody's picture go yes or no and how do you build a relationship or like sustain a love when you're talking to like 20 different people at once you know I think you're on point there with dating apps and, you know, having to choose based on appearances and the way you appear, the kind of immediate, you know, you don't know anything about the person, you, you can't go deeper. You just have, you know, that split second to decide if it is right or left. But I think there is also this another level that maybe dating apps actually help us to become more Kierkegaardian in a sense of writing, because, you know, you have to start a conversation, you have to become the seducer, you have to kind of, you know, make yourself interesting for that other person. And you have to create a personality, be that person out there. And then, you know, maybe when you meet in real life afterwards, you decide, well, actually, th- th- those two don't don't meet. But that's the kind of also, you know, the, the aesthetic uh, life that you build up. <laughs> this is just a side note. But I was reading this and it also reminded me of I had to write about female friendships in like the early modern period for a book and I had never written like or read these letters that these women would send to each other and they were so intense even if it's not a homosexual relationship that they're developing the love is so deep like it makes you think you've never really felt love before that's how I felt reading those letters and also you know me and Paolo were talking about this on Monday I was like damn I should write letters again (laughs) <laughs> because I don't know about you too, but I feel like we've gotten worse at expressing love. Or at least I have. Maybe it's just a condemnation of me. I feel like I've gotten worse at like expressing how I feel deep down. And whether that's with romantic relationships or with friends and family, like I really do feel like I've lost that in some way. I think it's a bit cultural as well, because... You know, I'm from Puerto Rico. My first language is Spanish. We have a lot more words to describe things than in English. And there's like the language portion. Then there's the showing it. You know, all of us, regardless if we meet for the first time, we like hug and kiss each other. And it's very like touchy and like, oh, como tu estas, todo está bien. Like love is incorporated into our culture period and to not express it it makes that person like an outsider so i think there is a bit of a cultural thing and there's also the different forms of expressing love i don't want to go into that pseudoscience of like love languages but you know we all express love in a very different way i like to cook and feed people i don't know why that's what i do that's how i express love and i do write letters i write postcards every single year there is also the technological difficulty Because when you sit down with a piece of paper and a pen, there is like a physical thing. Like you have to sit with what you're about to write because you can't really go back and erase it unless you have a pencil, but then that's lame. There is a permeance with a pen and a piece of paper. So I think it's also why it feels so much more dramatic. It made me think that, you know, in terms of expressing love, I actually prefer to express it in English rather than Estonian, because for me, English is I'm a richer language to express emotions that Estonian is. And we, we, we don't do that in, in this culture, maybe. So those things. But in terms of, you know, how it is written, I think it's an important point, actually, that this work that we've read, it's not just about aesthetic mode of existence. It's an aesthetic work in itself. So we, we've read a diary, we've read some letters, but the either or part one as a whole, it's got a section, as I mentioned, on Don Giovanni, which is basically a review of an opera. Uh, then it's got some aphorisms in there. So he creates the whole, you know, an aesthetic piece to express the aesthetic view of love or view of life. So whenever we approach love, maybe when we approach love as an aesthetic experience we we approach it through some mediums that are more more like that and when we want to do something deeper on on some higher level we we approach it through some other means 
also, I guess in the relevance you see in Kierkegaard's work today, I know you sent us a paper, which we will put in the description, thinking about Kierkegaard as not just a certain kind of writer, but also as a political thinker and a kind of Christian politics. And I wondered if you were able to speak more about that. Yeah, with Kierkegaard, there's there's a lot to unpack. And with, with that specific bit on the kind of Christian politics, I think why I've sent it, well, first of all, it's my paper, so you don't have to promote it. But but it's to show an example of when the love becomes important as the kind of, you know, an ethics, or, or in this case of politics uh, of doing something. And uh, in that paper, I also take the spheres of existence as the kind of paradigm through which to look at politics and in Kierkegaard's time. And he was critiquing the church politics uh, of his time. And today I was thinking about my own society in Estonia uh, at the time I was writing. We had, you know, a lot of church people making comments about the uh, uh, same-sex marriage legislation that we're going to have the law from the 1st of January will allow people to get married of. But at the time, the church was making comments and there was this whole debate about whether the church in Estonia, different context to England, when you have the state church, we don't have that. But, but in a society which is mostly secular, whether a church should contribute to a political discussion. And I said, well, in a, in a sense, yes, it can, uh, you know, as, as any other things. But if we look through Kierkegaard, the church has to live up to certain expectations then. And the kind of command in terms of love that is set is the command to love your neighbor and your enemy, which is much more important. And the example that I throw into that paper, which is very uh, resonating in, in, in Estonia, you know, we are on the border with Russia, is that I say that Ukrainians are commanded to love Russians. So, you know, how do you do Christianity, not just Christian politics, how do you do, you know, Christianity where you have to love someone who's trying to exterminate you? How do, you know, people who are being marginalized by the higher groups, how are they going to, you know, love their their enemies and, and that's what i meant you know by saying that Kierkegaard sets up so high and then says it is impossible but you know this is why it is a work this is why, where we have to strive to and this is why i say that you know christianity can engage with politics etc but then they have to keep in mind what are they called to do so if we talk about the united states and you know the time of trump administration Sure, you can use God to justify whatever, but keep in mind that the same God not just tells you, you know, certain things that you think he says, but he tells you to love your enemy and to, you know, welcome the stranger, etc. Yeah, it almost feels like Kierkegaard is going on like a pure Christian love that's not attached to a specific sector. Because, you know, you, you mentioned like the Trumpian evangelicism. That is a Christianity that has its own parameters and its own rules. And it feels like Kierkegaard's sort of like stepping away from, you know, Lutheran, from Catholic. It's just the umbrella term of Christian and like sort of relying more on like what the word actually says rather than the application of it. And then he sort of just goes back to its rudimentary definition. Because, you know, I grew up in, <laughs> I grew up in the States, hence the accent. And there is a conditional Christian love in the South and actually in just America in general. Like American Catholicism, it's its own breed of Catholicism that I personally did not grow up with because I was more in the Latino version of Roman Catholicism. Not saying one's better than the other, but it feels like when you look at Christianity through these like avenues of institution, that sort of Christian political does change faces. So I feel like for me, like hearing these words for the first time and then reading your article, it feels like it's sort of like back to basics with Kierkegaard in a way. It kind of is. And one of the facts about Kierkegaard's biography is that at some point he declares that he's not a Christian. His work is profoundly influenced. He writes about Christianity, but he says, I'm not a Christian because Christianity isn't what it means anymore. You know, the Christianity he sees in Denmark, the established church, they're not Christians, they're the servants of the state. They are just, you know, the bureaucrats, the clerks. They, they're, they're not Christians. So he says that. And when he writes about uh, the people in the established church, when he writes about pastors, uh, priests, uh, the bishops in the Danish church at the time, he calls them poets. And poets are the so to say the the apostles of uh, aestheticism. So, but he what he basically says is that the people who are in the church today, you know, they are living the aesthetic life. So that's where the connection is strong. And I think it can be applied to any kind of living. K Kierkegaard, after all, is the father of existential philosophy. So, if you want to look about, you know, how we should 
live, about our existence. And if we take those spheres, you know, we can apply it to anything. We can look at, I don't know, teachers and which teacher teaches you know, in a classroom as an aesthete, as an ethicist, uh, ethicist or as a paradoxically religious. And I uh, was giving a talk in October at a conference for teachers. And I said, for example, being an aesthetic teacher is me here giving you an exciting presentation about, you know, Kierkegaard, making it all fancy, having a great PowerPoint, you know, very engaging speaker, etc. But in the end, you get absolutely nothing. And then maybe, you know, a good teacher, the kind of paradoxical religious teacher is the one that gives you a boring lecture in a traditional kind of, you know, format, but it's actually so deep that you come out of it changed. My argument is that you could apply it to any place that we do. And in my PhD, this is what I'm focusing on, you know, but I take the spheres as well and I look at at teaching and how it happens. If we want to talk about, I guess, fan fiction media, the end discussion of this podcast, the winding down. In terms of fan fiction, I haven't found any fan fiction in a traditional understanding of fan fiction, but I can recommend a piece of fiction written by a great Norwegian playwright, Henrik Ibsen, called Brandt, which is inspired by Kierkegaard and Kierkegaard's philosophy. And spoilers, Ibsen completely misunderstood Kierkegaard, but it's still an interesting uh, reading, uh, reading to have. A lot of the work reminded me of like different songs, like you know, I, I talked about earlier, if it's still included, the Fleetwood Mac, Silver Spring, actually the entire Fleetwood Mac discography, I feel like is really comparable to The Seducer's Diary, because they all slept with each other, then they broke up and made each other sing about each other's breakups, which 10 out of 10. But um, it made me think of a lot of like, very hyper, like just the hyper sensitivity of music where usually songs just focus on a singular feeling. Uh, So I thought of Silver Springs. I thought of like, we talked about it on Monday, but I thought of like The Weeknd and his discography. So a lot of problematic men music. (laughs) The sad boy aesthetic, almost. You know, like, what is it? Beam me up soft boy, the Instagram. For some reason, I kept linking it back to things that like I view and watch and listen to right now. (laughs) Yeah, so it's not like a singular piece of media, but sort of the aesthetic of like the boy that reads on the train is like oh you've never heard of this book like it's giving that and also there is like a cultural fascination with that type of man where we know it's he's bad for us and yet we still go for it Igor, is there anything that you want to plug well go and watch don giovanni's opera i don't know (laughs) but in terms of personal uh stuff i guess you can just put my twitter i do change my handle from time to time so i'll try not to change it until (laughs) valentine's day and yeah sometimes i post completely random stuff and sometimes it's actually uh, very intellectual so thank you you for listening Uh, what? <laughs> I say we can say goodbye and happy Valentine's Day. Oh yeah, happy Valentine's Day. Live, laugh, love. <laughs> Live, laugh, lobotomy. In Estonian, it's called Friends Day because we just friend zone each other. So. <laughs> yeah. Again, thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you for joining us, Igor. You are a fountain of knowledge. Um, thank you for having me. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to Theoryish. We really appreciate it and would love to hear your thoughts. Check out our Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter at Theoryish underscore pod for up to date information. And please rate, follow, and leave a review wherever you're listening to the podcast. If you're interested in finding anything we have mentioned in the episode, please check our show notes or description to find more details. You can also contact us at theoryishpodcast at gmail.com. See you next time. Goodbye.